Rome, Mr. Rome, Mr. Manchester United himself. It had to happen. Like, I had to bring you on my channel so we can talk about the football. Not so much club football because we've got the whole season to do that. But most certainly, we have to talk about our country's performance in last night's quarterfinals um, defeat at the hands of the USA yet again. How are you feeling? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. I mean, there is no Arsenal without Manchester United, so it has to happen, right? It must have happened one way or the other. So I'm happy that you uh, that I'm here. Happy to have this conversation with you. Um, not so much so happy about the game last night, but we have a lot to get off our chest. So let's have it. <laughs> How are you feeling though? Has it all like soaked in? Um, what were your expectations going into the Gold Cup? Did you think that we could go all the way? Was it a semi-finals vibe, or how were you feeling? I, I wanted to win it, especially knowing that we went so close in the past in the last two Gold Cup semifinals, finals. Um, I went in, I went in um, into this competition thinking we're going to win it. And then looking around you by, with the teams around you, you can tell that the USA being a depleted team, Mexico not looking too well, I also have a depleted team. Um, and every other, Honduras as well, a depleted team. We needed to go into that competition with the intention to win it. And the fans came and watched with the zest and the enthusiasm of wanting to win this competition. So it was very, very disappointed that we went out in the manner in which we did yesterday to the team in which we did yesterday. And so it was really bad. I, 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 we, you and I were on the, the, the stream together and I, I was upset. I was pissed. And then, you know, waking up this morning, it felt the same way. It wasn't until I got the news about Varane and Manchester United that kind of brightened my day a little bit. Um, so it's kind of like a, a bittersweet type of day for me so far. Uh, but um, I, this, the, the results yesterday just just broke me. What do you think um, went wrong against the um, United States yesterday? That was a marginal um, defeat in, against the USA um, last night. As I was saying in the live stream, that I think it might come down to just the fine, um, fine margins. And unfortunately, it did do that and it didn't work in our favour. Um, so what do you think went wrong for us last night? It's you're right. It was definitely fine margins. The t it, both teams were going at it, especially in the second half. You can see that, you know, uh, the game opened up a little bit. At first, it was a little bit cautious, but I do think what cost us the game wasn't necessarily the players on the field, even though we had chances and we could have gotten, we could have scored a few of those chances. I think what caused us was the decision making on the bench from the coaching staff. Um, more specifically, the decisions from the coach. Now, the starting lineup, I didn't have much objections to. Um, you know, I would prefer to see Andre Gray start and Corey Burke be on the flank and Blair Turgot, you know, not start. But, you know, those decisions that you make, you have to stick to it. But the decisions within the game, the in-game management, I like to call it the Oligona social management was lacking because Oligona social lacked the in-game management to make substitutions right at the right time. And so does top a week more. It was absolutely astronomically stupid to do to have man like Blair Turgot play for 70, 75 minutes, not doing anything. While we have so many players options on the bench I could come on and with fresh legs to make to make you know make a change in the game so i do think the margin that got to, that made us lose that game was the coaching staff interesting um i'll pick up on your andre gray um comment um you wanting to include andre gray in your starting 11 um why is that um and i'm asking purely based off um andre's um recent um performance because for me i know you know um Shamar Nicholson, for example, he does put himself in good positions, but unfortunately, his finishing is a part of his game that he needs to work on. He's not as clinical as he should be. But I think if you're going into the quarterfinals, then you would select the players that have been um, finding the back of the net. And those players would have been Nicholson, Burke, um, Flemings and Bobby Reed. So why would you have gone for um, Andre Gray? When you look at the collective, the three, four games that we played on a whole, um, and you analyze Shamar Nichols' performances, he had that one goal in the first game. And since then, he has provided absolutely nothing throughout the tournament. And I've been saying this since the very first game. Um, Shamar gets into positions to score 
because the the other chances that Shaman Nicholas got in this tournament so far was provided to him by Corey Burke. If you think about Corey Burke has been the provider like Jesus and the five loaves of bread and fish the entire tournament. And what's what what's crazy about this is Shaman Nicholson didn't have to do much to get into those positions. We're not seeing move Van Isteray movement type from Shaman Nicholson to get into these positions. We're seeing wonderful work done by Korberg to get the ball to Shaman Nicholson to create to get those chances created. What I the reason why I would prefer Andre Gray over Shaman Nicholson is because of Andre Gray's movement. Now, if you think about the movement that we get off the ball from Andre Gray, coupled with the creativity that you get from Corey Burke on the right hand side, that will create, I think, a whole lot more chances. Let me take you back to the last the last game before the USA when Shaman Nicholson and Corey Burke came on when we were playing against Costa Rica. If you remember, Corey Burke went down on the flank, got past his, his defender and played a ball inside. And Shamar Burke's run as a striker was a straight run, straight to the goal, hoping the ball to come to him. And because of that straight run, the ball came, the ball came and Shamar ran past the ball and went behind him. If you guys remember that play, a footballer, a striker with any sort of movement would make a, a lightning type strike of movement when you're going into the box. Not only to get the defender off of you, but to create space to give yourself time to get to the ball. One straight movement restricts you so much so that after he made the movement, the ball was behind him. Now, had he hesitated, you know, jack it to the right, to the left, and then move towards the back post, he probably would have gotten there to score the goal. And that's just me being critical of because of the type of training that I've been through in playing the game and knowing how and learning how to make runs, hesitant runs in the box as a striker with crosses coming in so you can give yourself time to get to the ball. So Manny Carson doesn't provide that for you. And the last thing that I would say with that is Shaman Nichols is not the type of player to create chances for others. While Corey Burke will get chances and score them and create chances for others, we're not seeing that from Shamar. He gets the ball on the top of the box regardless of the position that he's in and he's looking to score, not looking to play anyone else in or get anyone else involved. Which is why I think that the fine, some of the fine margins that we're thinking about in the football world is the players that complement each other. Shamar Nicholson, and Corey Burke, the same height, same build, same everything. They complement each other. We need someone there that can complement Corey. They, I'm sorry, they do not complement each other. We need someone there that can complement Corey Burke. So if you have someone that's running around him, looking to get those passes that he's more than willing to play, which is what which is what Andre Gear will be, then you can see that partnership growing and building. So that's how I see it. It's interesting that you have, um, with, with some of the stuff that you've said, particularly about, um, you know, Nicholson not passing the ball to his other teammates and or not passing the ball um, in a timely fashion to his teammates when needs be. Um, what do you put that down to? Do you put that down to Nicholson being overly committed? And so he's just not thinking that, you know, this is a team's game. Sometimes stick to the basics. It doesn't necessarily always have to be fancy. And if that's the case, then I think another player who is guilty of that, unfortunately, is um Junior Flemings. Because Junior Flemings, I think, is, is very similar to um Nicholson's, Nicholson in the sense that he is overly committed they are two committed players for their country but they're just doing a little bit too much which then complicates the team uh over committed is one way to put it and and and, and, and i understand that that phraseology but i think they both of them are suffering from the same thing that leon bailey is suffering from and is that yearn to to perform so much so for the country so badly and um Leon Bailey is a little bit different because we know Leon Bailey's quality. I think the difference the, the difference between Shamar and Flemo with Leon Bailey uh, is that Junior Flemings and Shamar have this. It seems like they have this desire to prove to everyone that they're good enough to be the, make the national team because everybody else that's on the team should be arguably playing ahead of them, and there are others who are not on the team who should be on the team that's you know should be ahead of them. Like let's be honest, Jamar Low. Should be on this team and not and not um you know shamar nicholson i think jamal Lowe, and there's also um dude from west ham uh michael antonio if he's available he would be on this team and he wouldn't be a shamar nicholson 
Flemo would be the same if everybody else who's available who was in the diaspora was available and willing to play for the country is available those guys wouldn't be so they're trying their best to prove to the coaching staff and the rest of the world that they deserve to be there and as such they're forgetting the fact that this is a a, a team sport you know a lot of people out there who enjoys the flair goals appreciates and assists just as much just as much and they're not forgetting they're not remembering that and i think that's where this desire comes from for d- wanting to do so much at, at at this point in time and then by wanting to do so much they're doing absolutely little and nothing yeah, michael antonio is right around the corner and if michael antonio is in the team you know uh shamar nicholas is not in the team um there's also a host of players who can play on the left hand side as well that are available um and because these those guys are not in the team but are on the cusp of being a part of the squad these guys feel the need to be doing as much as they can um selfishly i would say to prove to the world that they're available and they're good they're good enough and at this point it's not it's not doing us any favors because as i said you know a goal is worship just as much as an assist in a team sport this is not tennis so that's why i think they they're doing we're definitely doing too much and it's to the detriment of the team i don't disagree with you there i think with them there's nothing wrong with like playing for the colors and playing for the badge um it's just about getting the right balance knowing when to be selfish and knowing when not to be selfish you can't go 90 plus minute when you fixated on yourself just focusing on you 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 because football is a team game so you have to make that pass when necessary and unfortunately a player like Femin's quality and at times like you said Nicholson as well that they haven't made those crucial passes when necessary aside from the fact that we've not been clinical up front you know that's come back to like backfire on us um that's some firepower some much needed firepower is definitely needed so you've mentioned the likes of Mikel Antonio and we can add um Kimar Roof to that um list as well and definitely i think yeah. that we do need to bring in um Jamal Law cuz from the wing we're in trouble going into the world cup qualifiers we definitely need to address the wing aside from the um defense and also the midfield I think maybe our weakest area comes in midfield and on the um wings and then followed by the firepower up top. Absolutely 100% and you mentioned the world cup qualifiers and we have so much issues going into the world cup qualifiers that we haven't even spoken about yet. Um let's I I rose this on my my own YouTube channel a couple of weeks ago that if Ravel Marsen still hasn't gotten a visa to get into the United States that means that every single world cup qualifier we have in the united states Ravel Marso will not be able to play that means the two that we might have against the usa arguably the most important ones in the usa we won't be able to play if there's any other country that is having covid issues and might have to just schedule their games in the united states Ravel Marso will not be able to play so where our midfield more than likely is going to look the way it is right now and the jff seems to not want to call seasoned midfielders defensive midfielders like anthony grant who's playing in 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 england right now they prefer to play michael ekta as a defensive midfielder because he sits and supports the defense even though yesterday they played speedy williams which did a great job right but if we have someone like a michael ekta who runs about the defensive third tackling up everything passing the ball outside of the defensive third then we wouldn't have to worry about making ekta sit down and sit put aside to a disadvantage so the onus is on the JFF to not only call up the right people to represent the country but get a proper coach to represent the country because boy that's another conversation just sticking on the topic of the midfield um because i think again i believe that's one of our weakest areas um personally i feel like we need to get a goal scoring midfielder somebody who's capable of providing those goals because we did lack goals and lacking goals is the reason why we exited the um quarter finals um so i think we need a goal scoring midfielder someone who can score goals and um create assists as well um I'm a little bit surprised that he left it so late to bring on McGee because going back to what we were saying on the live stream at um Ryan LFC we needed to put the USA in a position where they could draw fouls and I felt like you know when you don't have Leon Bailey available due to injury the next player that's on the bench that you should be bringing on in a timely manner surely has to be um McGee Oh absolutely and it's baffling to me how you go a goal down and then you go for the youngest player in the team to come on 
and to create something like wasn't he not available throughout the 60 45 70 minutes in the game you see what i'm saying so what's confusing about this all is that you brought down mcgee with the prem with the premise that he's going to come on 80 something minutes in we're trailing one nil and he's going to come on and create something that says to me just like garrett southgate with the england team that you had him only as a back pocket option to come on and create chances and do something just like Derek so get wanted those guys to come on and take penalties you didn't see him as good enough to come in in 70 minutes 60 minutes to make up to create something for you unless you thought the team that you put out there was the best and the only team that could get you a result which absolutely makes no sense you had leon bailey warming up yes he's coming back from injury but he fit if he's fit enough to be on the bench he's fit enough to play you get what I'm saying? So it's it's confusing to me the tactics that, and the approach the, 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 they made. We definitely do need a, 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 a goal scoring midfielder. And I do think if Nathan Redman comes through on his promise of wanting to play for the country, that fix that area that Bobby Reed was playing. And if you follow me on this one, if Nathan Redman comes in and sit right there behind the striker, Bobby Reed could then move to the right side of the, uh, uh, of the, of the attack tree, which is where he plays for Fulham. But Rome, up Bobby Reed. We... Sorry, Rem, continue. No, I'm saying that that would free up Bobby Reed to go and play his actual game. Bobby Reed is not a facilitator in the midfield. He's more of a, a winger slash, you know, forward, which I think is best for him to play right there. So we'll see. But before we get to the likes of um Nathan um Redman, don't you think it's a good idea for us to utilize our current talent pool so players that are within our reach that we could easily um call upon without any hassle? So someone like, you know, in midfield, someone like Martin Davis or even Peter Peter Lee. From what I've checked with Peter Lee, he's played for us what 17 times at, at senior level and he scored roughly six goals. So, you know, yes, people can say that maybe it's down to um, game time and at, at, um, with Peter Lee's down to game time and moving from one club to another. But there are still players within that team that have done that, that have um, not played for their club for an extended length of time. They've had, that have had disruption at club level, but are still being called upon. So Martin Davis, Peter Lee, Martin Davis is playing, I think, currently no. And he's getting you know a decent amount of game time, which is which is commendable. Um, and respect to Martin Davis anyway, they can do you doing anything from. Um, but here's here's my view on this. I've kind of graduated away from, and I mentioned this in my latest in the latest video that I made on on on, on this Jamaica performance overall on the YouTube channel, is that I feel like as a country we need to move away from this idea that we're going to use the, the platform of the Jamaica Football Federation as some sort of arm to the Salvation Army. And forgive me, it sounds kind of rough, but if players are not to a certain quality, if players are not up to a certain standard, then we should not be inviting them to play for the country unless it's some sort of friendly or you know Caribbean Cup competition. We need to get to a point where the best available is playing for us. Um, a lot of countries are doing it now. A lot of countries are fishing outside of their origins, outside of their, their borders to get the best to represent them. Because at the end of the day, your footballing program within your country should always be about bringing joy to your country and also let me know if you're here in the background, because if I've decided to, I will. It's <laughs> I can, fine, I can't it's hear fine. You. It's all natural. Are it's you sure? all. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, a lot of countries are moving away from this whole idea of homegrown um, talents within your country. What, what, if we're not England, Spain, Germany, countries like that who have the resources and the infrastructure to build talents from a very, very young age, we need to get to the point where we are fishing and getting the talents available to us in our diaspora because of parent a lineage, parental lineage to represent the country. Because remember what football does for your country, it brings joy to your country, it brings popularity. And in the sense, in terms of Jamaica, the most important thing it does for us, it brings money in the form of tourism. 
people start you go to the world cup you're on the world cup stage people start looking at you and bringing in more travels to the country get more money so we need to get victories we need to get to the pinnacle of football and the only way we're going to do that is to bring the best of the best into the country it's interesting that you've said that and it's, it's difficult to um disagree but before we can get to picking the best of the best um not many can argue with you on that because it does make a lot of sense surely there has to be some transparency because i don't know about you but i'm not sure what qualifies or what process is taken for a player to receive a call up because we've seen in the past where players don't have a club both um in the in the in the past and in the present where players don't have a club but they're still receiving a call up now you would look at a player like martin davis or peter lee that would say to themselves how is so and so getting a call up when they don't have a club and i have and i am with a club and i'm playing game by game i'm scoring goals i'm i'm getting the assist but i'm not getting a call up like what do you say to those players like you know regardless of how you might rate them um quality wise and, and that's a perfect point that you bring up. And I'm glad you brought it up because I, I've been on the coaches desk. I've been chastised because I've been the number one advocate for Rafael Marson not being a part of the team. Because um, I've been okay. saying since day one, Rafael Marson didn't have a club. He hasn't played for a club since um, November of last year. He just started playing for Derby. He should not be a part of the team. I should mm -hmm. not see a list of 60 men on the squad and a 60 man squad and anything says at an attack. And attach is what you do when you're going to a track and field and you're training on your own and you go to a track mm -hmm. meet, you put an attach next to your name. Not for footballers. And so I agree with you in the fact that people like Peter Lee and Martin sitting there thinking, what what I have to do, what do I have to do to get into this team while I'm playing and others are not and they're on this squad. So I think I if you revert back to what I'm suggesting in terms of making sure the best of the best, the highest quality is on there, this will not only remove those type of arguments because they know hey listen that guy right there arguably is better than me and he's playing for a bigger club than i so i have no excuses i have to just raise my game right um or on the flip side of that you will know you will say to yourself i need to be representing my country that means i need to show them and the rest of the world that i am better than anthony grant that i am better than nathan redman that I'm better than Jamal Lowe, that I'm better than Kemar Roof, which means I'm going to play my heart out. And if I continue to do so, I won't be at Philadelphia Union anymore. I'll be kicking it at Brentford. I'll be kicking it at Newcastle. Because it's possible for you to leave the MLS and go and become a, a, a superstar in the Premier League. Almaran did it. And Almaran is just a work hard more than anything else. So I think it's possible. I'm glad that um you... um made that reference when you said you spoke about it on coaches desk in relation to players who don't have a club but are still getting a call up and the reason why i wanted us to touch on it is because i remember when watson was being called up and watson didn't have a club and people were raging about it people were literally you could see steam coming out their ears right they were angry they were annoyed but with morrison it's a completely different vibe and i'm like hang on a minute why are you so angry or why were you so angry when it was watson that was getting called up when watson didn't have a club but you're turning the, the you're turning a blind eye for morrison so you know why is that why does that happen why are you willing to accept accept one but say no to the other Absolutely. And it all goes down to favoritism. You know, um, Javar Watson wasn't everyone's, you know, cup of tea at first. And he's old. He's almost like 40 years old. Right. So a lot of people weren't too excited about that, which for me, I wasn't excited about it. I wasn't excited about um, uh, Ravel Morrison being in the team in the first place. Again, because it goes down to we have to have standards of what we want to be. Are we going to be that mediocre are we going to be that, you know, um, that team that just calls you up because it's your, your, your name makes you popular? Are we going to be the team that's striving for something? We don't know the standards by which JFF selects people. We don't know if the coach has a say in who gets selected. But what we do know is that we look at a 60-man squad and we see people with unattached next to their names, which is unacceptable. You know, there was no Kemar Roof. Where is Jamal Law? You know what I'm saying? These things are absolutely unacceptable. And the JFF is not being transparent. It has never been. 
and we don't know this the, the 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 process by which they select people to come on board to play for us. So it's 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 uh, it's very confusing and very infuriating. Yeah, the the transparency pretty much doesn't exist. I'm not in favor of any player. It doesn't matter who you are. Any player receiving a call up when you do not play for a club, I think it sends out the wrong message. I think it's something that you have to tread very carefully with, particularly when you have the youth coming up into the game. You know what what type of what type of example are you trying to say to them? What type of example are you trying to set for the next generation of players coming up? Are you trying to say that? Are you trying to tell them that it's okay if you're a big name, you'll always get um, selected for the national side, regardless if you have a club or not? Or are you trying to say to them that you know work hard and you will be rewarded? At the moment, it's just like there is no transparency, there's no understanding, so everything is just very confusing. One hundred percent. That's that's absolutely true. And and if we continue like this, it's not going to get any better. So I think there's they, they, we definitely need management in the JFF. If we can't get rid of them, they need to change course. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Let's touch on um the change of coach. Is, um, because I know that's something that we've touched on on our live stream. Um, first of all, are you in favor of changing coaches at this um, present moment in time? And also, if we do go ahead and follow through and change change um coaches, um, what benefit can you see coming from that? I am one hundred and fifty percent unequivocally in favor of we of us changing coaches. I said it before. One of the <laughs> one of the videos I have on my channel that has the most was it views is the one that says Rick Morris clueless the fourth official YouTube channel go look it up you'll find it guys and I do think he's clueless because of the decisions and the choices that he makes in picking the team and in game management but I the reason why um I think that we need to change courses in terms of coaching is because let's be honest here the players that we're trying to attract to come in and play for Jamaica is 100 percent not going to be coached well under Whitmore. These are players who have been seeing international professional coaches with them since they were kids, right? Players who know the game because they've been trained the game from day one. Whitmore, highest level of coaching is a, a team in a Jamaica, a, a Jamaica. We cannot, we cannot literally, we cannot seriously ask Whitmore to coach these men at a, at a high level. Whitmore doesn't have the experience or the expertise. So that's basically setting him up for failure if you think about it. So I don't think that men like Andre Gray, you know, all those guys coming from overseas with the coaching and the professionalism that they're used to, to come into the Jamaica national team and sit there and hear Tapa with more, with making the decisions that he's making and see, and take him serious. If we're going to raise our level with the players that we have, we have to raise the level with the coach that we have. So we have to get rid of him. But don't you think that um, changing coaches at this moment in time with the with the qualifications for the World Cup um, just around the corner, don't you think that would add to the um, internal disruptions? No, I don't. Um, uh, we need to talk about, see, we just got finished with the World Cup, which means we have a month and change before we, we play another game, in the, uh, whether it's a friendly or um, one of the World Cup qualifiers. One other thing is we could see a completely different team in September. So it won't change anything because the national teams are as such that you could see one eleven this week and a totally other 11 the following game. You know, there's never a set thing. Once we have, uh, they, have a, they have time to implement what the coaches want, football is simple. It's very simple. And with that same 11, there's no one, with that same squad that we have right now, I don't see who out there can come here and convince me that another coach wouldn't be able to win the league with this with that eleven. Do you know anyone that plays for Canada right now? I can't name one. Yeah, Junior Oilet, but he's been around for a while. But the Canadian coach is bringing out a lot of proper football out of these guys because the coach knows what he's doing. If we have a team who is this, who has this much talent with someone who's willing and able to work with them and play some proper football. This man could be takes, turning over the Gold Cup without a shadow of a doubt. So a new coach coming in within the next month or so will have time to look at this, the, the players available, select the team that he wants, work on a system, 
footballers are intelligent and football is simple. You get them into a training camp three, four days before a match, and I guarantee you they can start playing the football that he wants. It's not necessary. You don't necessarily need a whole preseason or anything like that to go out and perform and win the uh, and win against Costa Rica. Yeah. So we can do it. It's just we need to get rid of him right now. Who would be your replacement? <sighs> that's a tough one, isn't it? Um, that's a tough one. It's I would definitely go fishing outside of the Caribbean and outside of the Americas. Um, uh, I do think it's going to be hard to ask Paula to take over the job um, full time. Um, it, it, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a tough one, but I do think man like Dean Burton can do an excellent job, especially what he's doing right now. Um, it, it's gonna be a tough one. It's gonna be a tough one, but there's I I can't specifically cite anyone because all the managers I know, all the managers that I know of, all the coaches that I know of, would not be taking the job at Jamaica right now, right? <laughs> who um, who were some of those names? <laughs> who, who's on your list? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we follow just, just you know, basically the big names that we, that you follow day in day out in terms of management. These guys are not going to be taking the, the 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 Jamaica job. Um, however, however, uh, the only manager right now that I think, um, if if we're able to get him, and just for this period to get to the Gold Cup, because I like how he plays football is the manager for Fulham. You know what I'm talking about. You're not, they changed manager yeah. um, recently, didn't they? So it's not Scott they Parker did, pre- well, well, okay, the previous manager, Scott Parker. Oh, Scott. I love how Scott <laughs> Parker plays football. I, Scott, so Fulham, Fulham was unlucky at most points, but you can tell towards the end of the season that they were playing some really good football. If we can somehow get Scott Parker to come and sit with the country for like, I don't know, a year and a half get us to the World Cup. I think we can. Scott Parker is a really good and talented football uh, coach. Wasn't a fan of him as a player with that tucked in shirt, but <laughs> I think he can do the job. <laughs> going back to your Scott Parker shout, I think he was going to take something, um, something quite stellar, a stellar offer for him to even consider <laughs> coming over to us with all the internal madness and chaos that we've got going on. It's going to take something extraordinary to even get him to listen to us, let alone sign the paper and say that he'll um, take on the job. Yeah, don't get me wrong. We don't have the resources, the infrastructure, the capabilities to get Scott Parker. Just like we won't have that type of infrastructure to get Mason Greenwood to play for the country. I'm just saying that's the type of coach that I would love to get here. I'm thinking the best... And I don't know as much as what the previous. I know there's a lot of like coaching going around in England, ex players and stuff, ex even ex reggae boys. I heard Dion Burton is coaching. I don't know how good he is or or for good. Yeah, good Burton. Job Burton doing. is at. Um, sorry to interrupt you. Um, Burton is mm-hmm. at uh, West Brom. But I was actually going to bring that to you. Um, do you think it's a sensible idea to recruit another ex reggae boy? I'm not doubting their capabilities. I'm just saying because they obviously have that relationship there already. Isn't it better to get someone who's just new to the scenes, no um, emotional attachment, no friendship, just completely new and neutral? What I do think, um, the new and neutral fact is it that's a very good point getting someone who is new someone who's not going to be biased is absolutely a very good shot however i do think that what paul all someone like paul hall or dean burton brings that's different from what we currently have in tapa is that they're not in jamaica in the weeds where there's a lot of bias and friendship going around and you know a, a, a lot of you choosing someone because you fit you you know you favor them you know what i mean they will come in neutrally whether you're an ex-player or you were just born in england or born in spain or wherever brazil like we we went down for anything more in brazil they will come in with the idea that i'm going to be neutral i'm going to pick the best team because i want to win there is for far too long there have been too much rumors of top of picking a team holding stay sticking with certain players because he wants to make sure that there's a Jamaican born player in the team. Well, that's not the point right now. The point is to make sure that we're winning. 
you fulfilling some wet dream that you have to make sure that someone from Seaview is on the team doesn't mean anything to me sitting here watching the game. You understand? I don't care about Tapa Whitmore fever dream. I want to see my team win. So I want someone who is coming who's going to be totally unbiased, willing to make the right, the hard decisions, not just the right decisions, but the hard decisions so that we can win the game. That's all that matters. That's going to be quite interesting um, in the next um, month or so. Um, personally, I can't see him go. I, I can't, can't see him um, leaving um, just because the World Cup qualifications is around the corner and because of that relationship between um, Tapa and the Federation as well. And also, I don't trust them to get the right man in the job. <laughs> they they are so, they're not pro pro proactive. I don't trust them to go out and recruit um sensibly. So, you know, we're in a position where it's just like, it kind of feels like we have to be careful what we wish for because we might get it and it might not be pretty because we know that, yeah. you know, they're very relaxed. Us, we're, we're thinking of solutions. You're saying you want someone like Scotty Parker and there'll be other people out there naming um, stellar names and applaudable names, but who are the JFF thinking of? Are the JFF even thinking of anyone? That's the scary thought. <laughs> You're right. And I, I mentioned Whitmore's fever dream, and this is somewhat of my type of wet dream as well, because if you think about it, um, these guys could not even pay the players when they went on the Qatar trip. I don't, they'll never find the money to pay a man like Scott Parker. <laughs> you know, it's going to be somewhat of a, um, if, if we're going to get a better coach than Whitmore, it will have to be a combination of us, the JFF, not us, the JFF making that strong decision of moving away from Tapa and then negotiating with someone who sees this as a project, not someone who wants to, to um, not someone who, who, who wants the money, but someone who sees this as a project who is willing to be a humanitarian coach <laughs> to come in and take over the job and say, listen, I'm going to get you guys back to the World Cup. I'm going to put on my Bob Marley shirt and we are going to sing Golden Qatar at the World Cup. That's what we need. Someone who's willing to take this on as a project for one to two years, get us to the World Cup and then say, I'll order for <laughs> that's a beautiful way of putting it I think this is probably a conversation for another um video because there's so many managers out there that we can think of both in England and um across the um diaspora so across Europe across America Canada to name a few um so I think we'll definitely pick this conversation up on another video so let's revert back to last night's game or let's look back at our um gold cup um appearance so far um what we did in the gold cup leading up to the quarterfinals um would you make of the the, the um defense and in particular the partnership between liam moore and damien low i i love it um i i rate the partnership with liam moore is a stellar footballer isn't he he's very very good and i think damien low right now after this competition has done very well for himself and he should be getting a move to a bigger and better club. Um, the, the low was absolutely immense. For everything that we needed, he was there. He was a soldier. Um, what showed me a different part of Damian Lowe was when we started trailing against Costa, Costa Rica. Remember, Damian Lowe stepped up in the midfield and started dictating the midfield from a defensive um, defender standpoint. And I, I, I can tell from there that Damian Lowe um, it's not only is he a leader, but he's a soldier. Now, I want to bring you guys back to one particular part, point in that game when Damian Lowe took the ball in the center of defense, dribbled all the way through the midfield to the right hand side and the flank, and put in two crosses in the box by beating three or four men. I will never forget it. Damian Lowe is a beast. I do think Damian Lowe deserves and he should get a better move. There's not much more I can say about Liam Moore because the guy is just too good. He's very good. And, and I think he can, he, he can be a stalwart in our defense for time to come. When it comes to the left and right back, um, I do think Omari Bell doesn't give us much going forward. And that's where Taxi Lawrence is coming. I think Taxi Lawrence is one of the best left backs we've had in a while. He is very good going forward, um, very fast, always up and down the pitch. On the right hand side is where we have the problem because the coach doesn't seem to have any faith in maps anymore. Mariapa doesn't, doesn't seem to be a part of the plan. I do think Mariapa would do well at right back. So much better than Alvas Powell, who was 
a broken record the entire competition. 30 minutes, 40 minutes in Alvas Power will bust. Can't run up and down anymore. And Fisher is just wild. Fisher is just wild. And there's nothing I can do if you explain what, what Fisher is doing. So I think Maps should have been the, the, the first choice, right? But he was not. Um, and you can tell that Amari Bell is unfit. So the but the goalkeeper speaks for itself, obviously, but I definitely think that center back pairing is is probably one of the best we've put together in a while. Just going back to what you said on um Damien Low, just to echo your praise of Damien. Aside from the football itself, I think it's important to credit him for his mentality. Because if you look back some years ago, Damien was getting pushed or uh, shoved under the bus on many occasions to the point where when the new recruits are coming into the team, a lot of people are saying, you know, yes, no more Damien Lowe is going to be, finally he's going to be pushed out of the side. But he's pulled himself together. He's taken the criticism on the chin and you're seeing some masterful performances from Damien Lowe. And I think he's actually surprised quite, quite a few, in particular the people who were very critical of his um previous performance over the years. Yeah, 100%. And you can tell that he gets the same mentality from his dad. You know, uh, I remember growing up watching Anandi Lowe playing and you can tell that, <laughs> that the genes run very man genes stronger, the man genes stronger than, than an iron crowbar, honestly. Yeah, because and no, the no, Lowe mentality, as you mentioned, is very, 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 very strong. And it, it takes a strong individual, a strong personality to come back and bounce back from that type of criticism and that type of Patriot. So um, much respect to what he's doing so far. I would hope and wish that he gets a move maybe to the championship, to the Premier League, um, just to build his personal brand more. Because at this point in his career um, and in all our footballers' career, the main thing is to move to a bigger, better championship, build your brand, build your personal brand and start focusing on life after football. Um, that's the wish for all of these professional players, not to just um, fade into into the ethers, but to build a brand, um, become something. That's why I'm happy that um, we have more players moving out of Jamaica and going into different places. Build your brand, become something and help the country. So looking forward to see Damien do, do, doing a lot more. I think you're definitely um, right about that. It's time for Damien to move out of the um, Egyptian Premier League and possibly look elsewhere in Europe, if not go back to the um, MLS. Um, I don't think that, um, I think he's above the Egyptian Premier League. Um, so just echoed what you have said, it's time for him to move on. So his agent has work to do and he needs to act fast and put him in a put him in a league that could only aid his development. Um, looking back at um, Bell and Taxi, I actually think that's a fair bit of um, good rotation that we've got between the two. Um, Taxi at the moment, I think, is, is understandable, his performance. Um, it hasn't been what we know he's capable of um that doesn't mean that he's performed um poorly because we know he's had personal issues that he's had to deal with mm -hmm. right so we're not going to be too critical of him of that because he's a human being um so i think between bell and taxi um i think taxi will you will see the best of taxi in the um in the world cup qualifi qualifications as well um, Bell, I think Bell will up his game as well. So I'm not too worried about the um their position. You know, there's always the possibility that as years go past, Ethan Laird still short in Manchester United, the young man from Manchester United. <laughs> there is a possibility that he might play for the country one of these days. So um, while Mason Green in his out of reach, Ethan Laird is a far better shot. He plays that right back, very skillful, decent young boy. So. Um, I'm going to continue to show him out on every platform that I get until he, he, he hears my cry. He's going to book up on my video one day on YouTube <laughs> and come represent the big side. <laughs> so when he does accept the call up, then we have Rome to thank, right? You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. And I take my payment by subscriptions, people. <laughs>
<laughs> I think the suggestion of Ethan Pinnock um, and pos the possibility of moving um, Liam Moore over to um, right back, that just illustrates their um, versatility. The option is there if needs be, a bit like when we've seen Damien Lowe play in the center of the park. Um, rightfully, he is a center back, but I think one of the benefits with our um, of our defenders at the moment, your likes of Law, Moore, and Pinnock is that they are versatile, so you can play around and like move them in different um areas if needs be, and that could only be a um positive for us. Yep, one hundred percent. What that's what, and that's the versatility in our players is is there for us all to see, which is why I keep saying this over and over. You know, which is why I think that a better coach. I'm sorry to keep going back it up, but a better coach can get so much more out of these players, man. So much more out of these players. Crystal, I you don't even know. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do a video yeah. on, on Tapa because I know that you have so much to say. So when we look into our video yeah. around who could, who should or who could potentially um replace Tapa, we'll, we'll definitely um give Tapa his airtime. 100%. <laughs> And we might even make that one a um live stream as well, so that people can comment and like possibly join us on on the panel. Let's um, see how that yeah. one goes. Yeah, who has been lovely. your your <laughs> who has been your player of the tournament? That's probably a tough question, but you probably already yeah. have an answer um for me. My player of the tournament, ah, uh, it has to be none other than Damian Lowe. I couldn't pick anyone else but Damian Lowe. Um, as I said, that it, he, he, he stood out in the defence. Even though Liam Moore has been very good, Damian Lowe stood out in the defence in terms of his um, his fight, uh, his, his agility, his, his, his ability to, to, to adapt, go in the middle, go down on the flank. I remember he got injured, soldier back, got up and came right back on. Um, his ankle got twisted, looked like he got twisted out of socket, but yo know, got up, got some spray and came right back on and finished the game. I think I think Damian Lowe is without a doubt the player of the tournament um for Jamaica. Write that down. And it's gonna be a good one for the future. I don't think many can um disagree with you. Like I said, um well done to Damian Law for his maturity. Um, so we've got World Cup coming up. Who would be the one player that you would like to see receive a call-up? I'm going to say one because I want to put you on the spot here. The one player that I would like to see receive a call-up for Jamaica, um, Mikel Antonio. Does that qualify? Because he's kind of like an automatic, isn't he? <laughs> no, it does. It but does you never qualify. Know. You never know. You're right. Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, Mikel Antonio. I would love to see Mikel Antonio call up for the for the country to represent us. I do think Mikel Antonio is probably going to be the highest profile footballer that we've had to play for the country. Um, I wouldn't even put uh, Leon Bailey in that regard, even though Leon Bailey plays for Bayern Leverkusen. We all know, we already know that Mikel Antonio playing for West Ham in the Premier League is probably going to be the highest profile player we've had since Ricardo Fuller, maybe. So, looking forward, I 100% looking forward to seeing him get called up for the World Cup qualifiers, leading us into the World Cup, leading goal scorer going into the World Cup. I think getting called up is one thing. I don't doubt um, that we will give him a call up. It's just whether or not his club allows him to leave. Because let's remind ourselves that this season, West Ham have the Europa League competition to look forward to. So, they will have a heavy schedule. And unfortunately, um, you know, Mikel has approached that time in his career or that period in his career where he is picking up injuries left, right and centre. So will West Ham want to risk sending Mikel Antonio to possibly help us qualify for the World Cup? Or will they say, no, we actually need you to stay here and fight for a potential top four finish or a potential top six finish in the Premier League? I mean, unless the West Ham are kidding themselves, I don't. West Ham should know that they're never going to win the Champions League. West Ham should also know that last year was was more 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 a chance than anything else that they got to that far. Um, will West Ham have a repeat of what they did last year? I don't know, but I do think it it comes all the way down to the player himself 
as to whether or not they they make the decision. And I understand it's going to be a difficult decision to make because again, he has to travel on the other side across the Pacific to get to where we're playing if we're playing over here, and chances are we will be. So it's it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a difficult decision. It's just um, it depends on what we we we. What West Ham wants, what Mikel Antonio wants. If he really wants to come over here and play, he will. Four or five games. I mean, in in uh, um when they take breaks for international tournaments, right? International tournaments are, t- are typically two weeks with three or four games. If he comes over and play the first two games and then leaves, it gives him time to recuperate. So there's always workarounds in all these things. Um, depending on how badly all sides want it, we can have him come play the important games. We don't need him against Costa Rica, but we need him against the USA. So. That kind of thing. Yeah, I think it'll be an interesting one with um Mikhail. And the reason why I brought up um the possibility of West Ham not allowing him to link up with the um reggae boys, particularly at the early stage of the um World Cup qualifiers. Um, I remember reading a newspaper article um some months back. My the editor of my of the newspaper that I write for sent me a new the the heading from a um newspaper, and basically the heading said um David Moyes and quote, don't let reggae boys take the mic. Um, so read. <laughs> so that kind of tells you um, how West Ham and how Moyes view the reggae boys. I think from I think from that article he was saying, you know, no disrespect to the reggae boys, but he would rather if Mikel played for England, um, which was a bit of a strange comment to make. Yeah, isn't that um, taking the mic? Isn't that some sort of phrase over there in England? A uh, d- little double entendre there for you, isn't it? Don't let reggae boys take the mic, which he's probably talking about Mikel Antonio. Okay, all right, all right. But, if, I mean, we know that um, Mikel Antonio was not going to play for England from, what, four or five years ago. They weren't going to call him up. They tried calling him up and, you know, tried to give him that little don't go play for anyone else. But um, I think for a player of Mikel Antonio's stature, he wants to represent, uh, he wants to play international football. The, if the opportunity arises that he could play for the World Cup, let's not forget how important it is playing for a World Cup for these footballers. You know, you, 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 you play your entire career and Ryan Giggs never played in the World Cup and he'll be remembered continuously for not ever playing for the world, in the World Cup, right? A lot of players look forward to those kind of um, competitions representing their country. So, again, it all comes down to what Mikel Antonio wants. If he wants it that badly, He'll, he'll go. I mean, we have a stronger chance of making it to the World Cup with Mikel Antonio. And if he thinks for a second that I will be here backing him, if he does not play in the qualifiers and expect us to call him up after we qualify for the World Cup, I'm have our next guest coming. At that time, I'm going to take the mic. <laughs> <laughs> All the best with that. I hope for your sake that it comes through. And um, hopefully, when you do show up at Old Trafford, it's not raining because you know what happens when it's raining at Old Trafford. Um, don't need to tell you about that. Um, so hopefully, we show up and it's a beautiful, hot summer's day. Either way, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Wrong. Do we a win, lose that drop? <laughs> Rome, where can people find you on social media? All right, people. Uh, you can f- uh, YouTube, the fourth official. Uh, make sure you drop a like and subscribe on it. Um, you can also find me on Twitter, officially Rome. Instagram, fourth official, fourth underscore official. You can find me there as well. Uh, the content will always be about football, heavy bias towards Manchester United, and of course, the reggae boys. So, yeah, again. Twitter, officially Rome, Instagram, <clears throat> fourth official, fourth underscore official, and on YouTube, the fourth official. Thank you very much. <laughs> People, please do check him out on Instagram across all social media. He's a pretty sound guy, despite the fact that he supports Manchester United. So please subscribe to his YouTube channel. Check him out on Twitter as well and give him a follow and keep an eye on his content because this season he's going to give you some unique um contents which will be very informative and engaging. So please give him a follow and subscribe to his channel. 
Rome, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on my platform. Finally, even though you're a Manchester United <laughs> fan, um, you're actually a decent guy. I don't even know how that makes sense, but somehow it does. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, the Lord work is mysterious. Yes. Look what he did to you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, like I said, it's been a pleasure um, having you on my platform, and I'm sure we're going to do this many, many times throughout the um, pending season um, with numerous um, conversations around football. And um, I trust that it won't just be about Arsenal and Manchester United because there are other clubs there to talk about. Um, so I know that we're going to put through some quality content. So, you know, thank you again for stopping by and helping me to um, review last night's match. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to come on. And it's always great to talk like-minded things with like-minded people. Um, so, yeah, we love the game. And you can tell that you have a very big drive for the game and a love for it. And I appreciate that. Um, and I look forward to us having conversations throughout the season. Again, not only about our clubs, um, but definitely about other clubs and um, celebrating wins, losses, and mostly me laughing at you for the Arsenal losing. So. <laughs> I keep telling people that Arsenal and Manchester United are like cousins, like cousins that pretend that they hate each other, but deep down they've got yeah. love for each other. So everything yeah. that you say, I'm just going to take it on the chin. I'm going to be like, you don't really mean that. He's just Manchester United fan. That's, that's just what they're like. So and I you know what? to have a banter from you. You know what? You're absolutely right. Because I last season when Arsenal was going through that slum when you are like 16, I was genuinely sad. While I was laughing out, outside, I was because it's it's sad to see uh, you know Arsenal struggling like that, knowing where you're coming from. I grew up watching Manchester United and Arsenal fighting for the titles back to back to back, and I just didn't want them to see. Even though it was fun laughing at them losing, I didn't want them to see them that far. So, yeah, hundred percent. You're my little cousin. That I don't like, but I really love you. So. <laughs> I'll echo that feeling is very, very mutual. And actually, um, I'm going to um, tap on, um, continue what you've, uh, pick up on what you've actually said um, in relation to Arsenal season last season and, you know, the fact that we were literally looking at relegation bang in the eye. I think for me, it was the same when you guys had David Moyes, where David was coming out and like breaking up, breaking numerous records. At, so at one point, I was like, I actually do feel bad. Like, because like you said, we grew up being rivals of each other. And the thought of Manchester yeah. United getting relegated, I was just like, it just doesn't feel right. Like, I want you yeah, in the yeah. same league as, as me so I can laugh at you. Even if you're doing better than me. If you lose one match, I want to be able to call you up and laugh at you because <laughs> we grew exactly. up, like, harassing each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Uh, let, long let it live. Long let it live. Okay, let the banter remain. <laughs> I echo that. I echo that with passion. Um, so yeah, um, again, guys, please check out Rome's channel. Um, do subscribe and give him a follow when you can. And thank you for sitting down and watching us um review um last night's um defeat. It's unfortunate, but uh, it is what it is, and we will take it on the chin and move on. <laughs>